mind of what, what things were like at that point in time, which was you know a point in time that the railroads were really at their peak probably. The average life expectancy in the U.S. was 47 years of age. 14% of the homes had a bathtub. 8% had a telephone. <laughs> a three-minute telephone call from Denver to New York City cost $11. There were 8,000 cars in the U.S. and 144 miles of paved roads. Maximum speed in most cities was, was 10 miles an hour. Alabama, Mississippi, Iowa, and Tennessee were each more heavily populated than California. At that point in time, California had a total population of 1.4 million people and was the 21st most, most populous state, uh, uh, state in the Union. The tallest structure in the world was the Eiffel Tower. The average wage in the U.S. was 22 cents an hour. The average worker made between, made between $200 and $400 a year. A competent accountant could earn up to $2,000 a year, a dentist $2,500, and a veterinarian between $1,500 and $4,000. And a mechanical engineer, which there were very few at that point in time, made a whopping $5,000 a year. More than 95% of all births in that year took place at home. 90% of all U.S. physicians had no college education. And instead, they attended medical schools, many of which were condemned to the press and the government as being substandard. Sugar cost four cents a pound, eggs were 14 cents a dozen, and coffee cost uh, 15 cents a pound. Most, most women wash their hair once a month, whether needed or not, <laughs> and, and they, use, they generally use a mix of borax and egg yolks. Now, doesn't that sound romantic? <laughs> uh, Canada passed a law that year prohibiting poor people from entering their country for any reason. The five leading causes of death in the U.S. were pneumonia and influenza, tuberculosis, diarrhea, heart disease, and stroke. The flag at that point in time had 45 stars, Arizona, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Hawaii, and Alaska had not been admitted to the Union yet. Population of Las Vegas was 30 people. <laughs> Crosswords, puzzles, canned beer, and iced tea had not been invented yet. <laughs> oh, only, oh, no, let's start again. Not only, but, but one of 10 U.S. adults could not read or write, and, and only 6% of all Americans had graduated from high school at that point in time. Marijuana, heroin, and morphine were all available over the counter at corner drug stores. Uh, let's see, heroin supposedly clears the complexion, gives buoyancy to the mind, <laughs> regulates the stomach, and is the perfect guardian of health. 18% <laughs> of U.S. households had at least one domestic service, or servant, and there were about 230 reported murders in the U.S. that year. So I'll just to give you a little snapshot of how things were back then. Now we're going to go back a little bit further. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, about the Wego and Ithaca Railroad. Uh, the original means of, of, of goods movement and people moving like that between the Wego and Ithaca, there was a, quote, turnpike that was built in 1809, which probably wasn't much more than an Indian trail. It was probably good for pack horses and not much more than that. Some years after that, when we got into the canal, craze that existed in the eastern part of the country, there was a study made to build a canal between Ithaca and Owego. And some of the problems were that you had a 600 foot elevation to get out of Ithaca, which is <coughs> very interesting when you're talking a canal. Uh, you know, the seasonal use of a canal was considered a negative. It was doubtful that there would be an adequate supply of water without some major uh, infrastructure activities. Uh, there was a depression in the middle of the route, in addition to the 600-foot rise that you had. Uh, and all of that meant a large number of locks, which adds significantly to the expense of that kind of construction. And it, uh, even then, uh, the cost of putting railroad in was projected to be about one-third less than that of the canal. So the canal idea dropped. In 1828, uh, the state of New York granted a charter for a rail line from Ithaca to Owego. It was the second railroad chartered in New York State. Work began in 1832, and in 1834 it was operational and became the fourth oldest operating railroad in New York State. Uh, bear with me just a second. The anticipated traffic pattern was uh, projected as being primarily from Ithaca to Owego 
and, and, and then floating down the Susquehanna River, which uh, in that time period, there were a lot of goods that, 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 that you know, did, did take that avenue to get, get, get uh, south primarily and to Harrisburg, Baltimore, and, and those locations. You know, lumber was transported that, that way. Uh, farm goods were, they would build a float, and there, during periods of higher water, they would, they would float that south. And uh, when it got down in, into the lower extremities of the Sus Susquehanna, they would uh, tear the, uh, the float apart, sell the lumber, and they would essentially walk back up here and then report that, that and, and then repeat that kind of activity later. Uh, in terms of the first train, it, it ran on April 2nd, 1834. It ran from the top of Ithaca Hill to Owego in about four hours, and it was horse-drawn. Uh, in terms of getting goods up out of Ithaca, <coughs> there was a, a horse-powered capstan that was at the top of the hill. And uh, they, they, they had two different tracks, and they would haul loaded goods up, and at the same time, they would, uh, they would drop empty cars down so they could be filled up. And that, that stayed in place for, for several years. There was a, a steam locomotive purchased in 1840, but it was tremendously underpowered. It was not successful. Lasted only a short time period in terms of use, and, and the railroad reverted to horses. By 1847, uh, the roster of the railroad listed one locomotive and it said store, which was our friend I just talked about, five passenger cars, 55 freight cars, 40 horses and, and, and 32 employees. In 1843, the railroad was, was recharted to the Cayuga and Susquehanna Railroad. And in 1849, uh, they did purchase a, 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 another steam locomotive that was successful. In 1854, the uh, track, which had been laid to the standard four foot eight and a half inch uh, gauge, was widened to six foot to be compatible to the Erie Railroad that ran through a week ago. And uh, shortly after that, you know, the Liggett's Gap Railroad uh, purchased the Ithaca and Owego line, and the Liggett's Gap uh, was soon to become the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. And uh, they were looking for the ability to be compatible with the Erie because the Liggett's Gap Railroad ran as far as Halstead, PA, and uh, was, was developing a relationship where they would uh, you know, physically <coughs> tie in with the Erie, but, but they needed the six-foot gauge uh, a track up through here in order to be able to move the cars as they would on the Erie. So uh, that lasted until 1878. At that point, it was changed back to to uh, four foot eight and a half. So, uh, but w what happened then is the, the commerce pattern changed, and that it, it tended to be mostly goods moving north now. A lot of coal and other products that the that the Lackawanna moved and. Uh, Basically, you know, the railroad served as a path for the, for the goods to, to, to get in, into Cuba Lake, where there was a connection to the New York State Barge Canal, the back on the Erie Canal. So that was the commerce path that you saw, and, and, and was the reason that the, that, uh, that the Lackawanna was interested. And uh, some years later, uh, they did acquire uh, two branches out of Binghamton, uh, one of which went uh, through Syracuse to Oswego, and another went to Utica. So, so they ended up you know, having multiple paths you know, to, get, to get to the north. And it was not until 1882 and 83, I'm sorry, 1881 and 82, that, that the Lackawanna built from Halstead to Buffalo. And uh, of course, those tracks were, were placed uh, through here, just about where 17 lies. Uh, the Lackawanna, as a separate railroad, went out of uh, business in October of uh, 1960 when it merged with the Erie to form the Erie Lackawanna. But between Binghamton and, and uh, Corning, uh, uh, in 1959, the traffic patterns changed so that bo both railroads operated pretty much over the Erie for that distance. So you started seeing the Lackawanna tracks torn up at that point in time. Uh, let's see where I'm uh, in terms of anything significant, things were just the normal commerce, movement of people, that sort of thing for the next you know, several years. Uh, even into the, in, into the 1920s, you know, most essential goods were, were moved by the railroads. We're talking agriculture products, manufactured goods, uh, just about it, uh, anything you could need, appliances, what, what limited amount of that there was, 
it all came by train, and, and, and the railroad was the primary people mover also. And in those early years, of, of there were Pullman cars that moved from Ithaca to Owego, and then and on the main line went to various cities. You could go to Chicago, Philadelphia, New York City, Buffalo, uh, a whole range of places by, by Pullman. Uh, in terms of, of local activity, uh, the notes I was able to find talked about in Catatonk uh, shipping potatoes, baled hay, and other ag products uh, from Catatonk uh, to Owego primarily. Uh, from Candor, uh, in terms of goods going out, uh, cattle seemed to be one thing that, that, that uh, showed up in some of the, of, of, of the material I had. It talked about cattle pens being located near the station and, and small herds of cattle being moved through the village, uh, uh, placed in the pens, and uh, two to three carloads of livestock being moved south out of Candor uh, per week was the normal uh, you know, traffic which generated. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that, that all the other goods like that, that that came by rail were very important to Candor as they were any communities, and communities back then that did not have rail lines to them, uh, you know, generally didn't have the growth that, that those that did had, and you know, generally, uh, you know, life was a little tougher. Uh, you had to move goods from the near, nearest railhead by horse and wagon. Uh, same thing is true with moving people, and, and as a result, it, it just you know stymied commerce. Uh, if if you look at Nichols, for example, Nichols didn't have the uh, the Lackawanna until 1881. And, and you had the Erie Railroad across the river in 1849. And for that reason, uh, there was quite a business in terms of ferries on, on, on the river so that uh, they could transport goods across because uh, a lot of times, you know, bridges at that time period had weight limits and that sort of thing. So there was a ferry at Lounsbury, there was a ferry at, uh, uh, at Owego, uh, there was one down near Hiawatha Island, and I believe one in Appalachian. And I, I think that's a fairly normal pattern across the southern tier. Uh, the other commodity that was very important from a freight traffic standpoint was milk. Uh, milk moved to regional uh, milk processing plate, uh, plants from basically every station, essentially, that had a dairy farm close to it. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that milk traffic ended up in New York City, especially with the, with the, with the, the, uh, the larger railroads in the Northeast. And the Lackawanna was one of the larger carriers. Uh, so, so that was basically picked up at every crossroads, every place that, that, that they could, because you, you, you had to move it fairly quickly. You had to keep it refrigerated, it would spoil. But I think the interesting thing was, you know, as we know dairy farms today, you know, 100 head being milked is not a big farm. But uh, back then, uh, probably one to four cans a day was the most that would, that would come out of uh, the average farm. So they really had small herds back then. But, but the milk business was, was a very, very big uh, part of the traffic uh, for roads like the Lehigh, the Lackawanna, the O&W. Uh, uh, the Erie had, had some, maybe not quite as much as the other three. Uh, you know, milk moved from the New England states uh, down in, in, into New York City and also smaller cities en route. So uh, that sort of traffic lasted until the late 30s. In some areas it lasted until the 40s. But by and large, in terms of a big revenue portion of, 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 of Northeastern railroads, it was, it was you know, pretty significant by the start of World War II. Uh, just as an illustration, my wife's uh, family, her, her grandparents had a, a small farm in, in, in uh, Columbia Crossroads, uh, just north of Troy, PA. And uh, that, that, that milk moved out on the Elmira branch of the Pensy, which, which, is, which is one of the two books I did on that, on that particular line. But, uh, but even up until uh, the pre-World War II time period, uh, that farm did anywhere from, from, from 100 pound can to maybe maybe one and a half cans per day. That was the output. And yet it was enough that, that her grandparents could, could basically have an existence uh, you know, from that and you know, selling some other produce and that sort of thing. So, so you know, farms as we know them today were, were grossly different in terms of scope than they, than they were you know, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, passenger service lasted until 
uh, September of 1942. Uh, as I said earlier, it was the primary means of, of a people movement. Uh, the casual traveler, the business traveler, whatever you wanted, wherever you wanted to go, uh, you know, you probably went by by, by train. Uh, in the early 30s, uh, New, New York State was kind of ahead of its time in that there were about 30,000 miles of paved roads in New York State, uh, which for the size of the state number of roads, it was a much higher percentage than almost any other state in the Union. Uh, in terms of, 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 of moving people for the Lackawanna, one of the big sources of, of people traffic was Cornell University. And the Cornell student had the choice of either the Lehigh, which, which the main line ran through Ithaca, or the Lackawanna, which was basically a branch with little engines and so forth. Uh, in terms of schedule time, uh, the Lackawanna would, would, would move a person faster by rail from Ithaca to Wego to New York City than the Lehigh would from Ithaca uh, going into Jersey City. Or I'm, I'm sorry, into Penn Station, which, which they did after World War I. So, uh, you know, the Lackawanna, they had a very short route going, going to New York City from, from Buffalo to New York, where, where typically these are measured. The trackage was 396 miles uh, from Buffalo to New York uh, by, the, by, by the Lackawanna. And uh, the Lehigh was uh, about 440 miles. And, you know, that adds up to time. And the Lehigh had, had, had more mountain ranges across, too. So, uh, in terms of stories about uh, uh, the branch, I was able to pick up a few things. Uh, I, I was reading a newspaper clipping where, in the 1930s, uh, an afternoon passenger train became snowbound at, at, at Herrick's, which the clipping said is near where the Catatonk Golf Course is now. Apparently, the, Her the Herrick family resided there, and uh, they became aware of the plight of these folks, so they went out with coffee and refreshments for, for the folks on the train until they were able to get it free of the uh, snow. Uh, let's see, I need to describe a type locomotive to you. It's called a camelback. And if, if you can envision a, a steam engine, normally you see the cab on the back end of the, of, of the engine. Well, a camelback had, had a cab that was in the middle of the locomotive, and there was a, a station at the rear where the, where the firebox was, where the firemen would actually shovel coal in. And what happened is when they started burning hard coal, which is anthracite, and that's what, what was mined in the northern sections of PA, uh, they, they needed a larger grade area in order to burn the same amount of coal and generate the same BTUs. And, and the engines at that point in time were fairly small, so when they made the firebox wide enough to handle the hard coal, they, uh, basically there wasn't room with the cab back there. So a lot of the roads that burned hard coal uh, built these camelback locomotives, and they, and they ran through here for a lot of years. Uh, again, on the Lackawanna, they lasted, you know, they lasted until World, World War II. Uh, the Jersey Central, they were still running them in 1954. Uh, the Reading had them, uh, the Reading got rid of them post-World War II. Uh, the Erie had gotten rid of theirs, with the exception of three engines they leased to the Bath and Hammondsport, they had gotten rid of theirs uh, by the start of the Depression as had, had, had the Lehigh Valley. Well, the Lehigh Valley still had some in 36 and 37. But anyway, uh, one of these trains with a camel back on the front end had stopped at, at Catatonk. And, and the firemen had to go over to the bushes to call up nature, shall we say. And uh, the engineer didn't realize he wasn't there, so he took off. <laughs> he got to the next station, and the fireman telegraphed ahead, or had the, had the station agent telegraph ahead. And so they stopped the train, and the train had to back down to, <laughs> to uh, that location to pick them up. A light thing happened to one of the, uh, the conductors. And in this case, it, 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 uh, it was not specified what type of locomotive it was, but uh, basically they left the conductor on the platform. And uh, this, the, this time that they held the train at the next station, and he caught the next train up and got back where he was needed to be. <laughs> So, uh, the other thing I found most interesting, uh, we moved here in 1960 from the Hudson Valley. Uh, 
even though I grew up in Elmira, um, I started with IBM down there in, in, in 1959. I was down there about a year and a half, and I got a chance to come back here, so we took it. But in downtown Owego was the Nye Bakery. And I found some notes that the Nye Bakery shipped fresh baked goods to Catatonk and Candor on one of the morning trains each day. So I thought that was a rather interesting you know, distribution of goods that took place. <coughs> Uh, probably one of the, th the things that I consider kind of a fable, there, there is a, I've had people tell me that, 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 that the curved railroad bridge in Owego is almost like the eighth wonder in the world. Okay, well from an engineering standpoint it was nothing unusual, it was just a, a straight section bridge that happened to be on a curve, so they make it a little wider to allow clearances and like that. But uh, there, 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 there had been a lot of what I would call myth about that bridge you know, locally in terms of its uniqueness. And probably for you know, where you would see bridges around here, it, it's, it's unique. But if you look globally at, 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 at bridge you know, design and structure, it, 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 uh, it, it really was not. Uh, but, but the branch does have a lot of nostalgia to it like that. And one of the reasons there was a lot of nostalgia was the the fact that that bridge limited the size of locomotive that could be used on this line. So as a result, as long as the, the, uh, the line was in operation, you saw small steam locomotives operating, okay? Uh, and, and, and you saw not large loads. You know, you were, by, by, by the middle 50s, you were seeing, on some railroads, you'd see cars that could handle 100 ton of goods, which is very common today, but uh, in that point in time, let's say a hopper car that hauled coal, typically it would haul 40 to 50 tons. So, so you start talking 100 ton load, you have a very, very big car and a very, very heavy load. Uh, that bridge would not handle anything like that. So, so it was limited in terms of locomotives, it was limited in terms of, of, of you know, some limitations to, in terms of goods, but I think that in the years that the line was in existence, that did not have an impact on, on, on the line. But uh, anyway, the line lasted until until 57 as far as Catatunk North. And I think it was just a general decline in surface in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in business because by that point in time, the northeastern roads are really starting to struggle. Uh, you know, the Lackawanna had, had, had posted losses for a, f a few years at that point, and their car loads was declining. And you know they were looking to 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 di divest themselves of you know some of their trackage, and uh, they had a branch to Richfield Springs that ran off the, the line up through Cortland to Syracuse. That was dropped, and this branch was dropped. Uh, the, the other lines I think still had enough traffic, and, and lasted until the EL time period. But anyway, there was a local thrust to keep the line open that that I think centered around Catatonk. Maybe some of you can recall it maybe better than I can actually, but my understanding was Warden Van Scoy wanted the line to stay open and even went as far as, as offered to buy the line or at least that portion of it and operate it. But, but the Lackawanna would, 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 uh, would have no part of it. So my understanding is in the spring of, of 1958, uh, you know, the line was shut down and uh, the bridge of you know, the last uh, elements of it in this area uh, was torn down, I think, in the summer of 1959. I know it was, it was 1959. I don't know if any of you, you know Lois Barton, but, the, but I used to work with Lois, and, and Lois's family, you know, she grew up at the foot of the bridge on the, on the North Shore, and, and they had several photos of the bridge before it was torn down, and during the process of it torn down. In fact, I, there was one photo, and, 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 uh, and Howard, you may recall, you know, Jimmy Howe? Okay. It's, that, you know, Lois's brother. Well, well, he went out on the pier, and he was, I gather, uh, Jim's a little younger than I am, so he was probably uh, maybe out of high school at that point, perhaps. But, but he stood on the pier with his, with his head up between the ties, and one of them took, took a photograph of it. And so when you looked at the photo, it looked like a train had gone over and cut off somebody's head. Okay? <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, you know, Lois let me borrow a lot of those negatives, so I, 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 I printed up a lot of the shots of the bridge laying in the river. You know, they did it in, in, in a time period of low water so they get the steel out of there and so forth. But, uh, and of course, uh, now if you get a, a dry summer so the river is very, very low, you, you, you can still see the pier locations in the river. 
uh, you know, downstream from the existing bridge. Uh, the abutment's still there on the north shore. Uh, if you go by Stackmore, there's still rails in the street that goes down to the middle school. And if you go down McMaster a little further towards the tracks, you can see the embankment. You can see the embankment in back of, of, of uh, William Street. And uh, of course, coming up 96, you can see it. And I believe the coal trestle is still in the village here, isn't it? Uh, there was the coal barn, yeah. Yeah, OK. And I think up in Beesmer, if I recall, there used to be a resident up there called the Stables. And if you went across the street and uh, walked down that street 100 feet, there was a base of a water tower that uh, still said Lackawanna on it. And uh, that's about my experience in terms of finding elements of the line. Uh, what I'd like to do, OK, another line that, that, that ran to Cander was the, was, a, was a, the ECNN. OK, it started out as, as a, the Utica, Ithaca, and Almara. And that was a line that uh, it, let's see, the, the terminal was at Fifth Street in Almara, which is, uh, they actually built the Clemens Parkway where, where the station was. And it ran north to Horseheads, and then out to Breezeport, to Erin, uh, to Park Station. And Park Station was a station on that line. It dropped down the hill to Van Etten, uh, ran to Spencer, came over to, I guess, what would be called West Cander, and swung north up to Wilseyville, and ended up at Cornell, uh, up on top of the hill and back of the campus. They used to have a power plant up there, and they used to move coal in there. Then it swung east over through uh, Freeville. And at Freeville, it was interesting, uh, the Southern Central crossed the ECNN at Freeville, and both became part of the Lehigh Valley Railroad system in uh, from 1905 to 1910. So you had two branches of the Lehigh crossing each other. And back then, there was enough passenger business that, that this station was a tremendously busy station. And uh, part of the track is still in from, from a lumber yard it's just off Route 281, uh, just just out of Cortland. If you if you take 281 north of Syracuse, you cross this rickety railroad track uh, just beyond the N.W. Ruth Beer Place, and that's the that's the ECNN trackage. And it went through Cortland, went up, up through Truxton, and a whole bunch of towns that follow Route 13, and ultimately goes to the the, the, the east end of, of of Oneida Lake, you know, Sylvan Beach area, and from that point it went to Camden, New York, which is just, just above McConnellsville, and it tied in with a branch of the New York Central that ran from, from, from Alaska to Utica. And uh, that particular line, uh, the Lehigh started cutting it back just about the beginning of the Depression. I've got some photos, and I wasn't able to dig them out, uh, that, that were taken by, by a friend up in, up in Millport uh, of the last train that operated on the line, and it ran from, from uh, from Almara to uh, Van Etten and, and uh, terminated. And that was, I think, in 1938. Uh, there was a very big trestle on that line at Park Station. And there were some, some impressive photos that were taken of that, that being dismantled. It was a, a curved steel trestle. Uh, I had a gentleman call me about a year and a half ago who lives along 96. And to be honest, I, I didn't jot down his name, but I'll, I'll tell you what he found. The, the, the embankment for that line ran through his property, and he had acquired a metal detector. So, uh, so he was <coughs> out on the embankment, and uh, up until 1890, 1895, all trains didn't have metal couplers. A lot of them used a, uh, I'll, I'll call it a link, basically a, a, uh, a steel oval that was probably about 10 inches long, maybe 4 inches wide. And they actually dropped a tapered pin uh, through a, a, a hole in each of the cars. It's called Lincoln Pin Coupling. And, and he found a link uh, with his metal detector. But he also found a, a journal box, which is the cover uh, on the truck where the end of the axle is. And they, they have a bearing that they, they had to keep lubricated. Uh, he found a cover that, was, that had cast in it the, 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 the Tioga Railroad, which was a line south of Corning. They ran down in, into Blossburg and that area, and you'll pick up some some semi-bituminous, or I'm sorry, semi semi-anthracite coal down there that, that, that the Erie and the New York Central hauled out. And, and and that road ceased being the the uh, 
uh, you know, Tioga Railroad uh, you know, prior to, to 1900. So that, that, that journal cover had been laying lay there for a lot of years. Uh, I think probably the, the quantity of goods moved on, on that particular line of the Erie was, I'm sorry, that particular line of the Lehigh was uh, quite a bit less than what moved on the Elmira branch, uh, primarily because uh, you know, the number, the point in time that it was torn up versus the point in time that the Ithaca branch was, 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 was torn up. So uh, that kind of covers what I have. Does anybody have any, any questions, anything that they'd, they'd like to add to it? I'm, I'm game for any comments. Anybody has any questions? Yes? When were the switchbacks put in Ithaca? The switchbacks were put in about 1850. Uh, when they had the cap stand that was, that was horse drawn, that was before the time period of, 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 of the switchbacks. And uh, when they got that, that, that second steam engine, uh, I think it was 1847, they still used that same process to get the loaded cars up the hill. But uh, I think when the Lackawanna came on the scene of the Ligas Gap Railroad at that point in time, they, they re-engineered that uh, so they would have switchbacks and, and, and you know, could pull the goods up by, by, uh, by locomotive at that point in time. And some of the photos I've got here do show some elements of the switchbacks. They, they start out uh, you know, showing the main line in the Wego. So if you kind of go, if, if you're facing the picture and you go left to right, but the, the first photo is the, uh, is the Lackawanna Limited in, in 1939 under the Court Street Bridge in Oweto. And uh, there's another shot of a non-streamlined steamer, which is the, uh, also the Lackawanna Limited. And then to the rear of that is the Ithaca train. And then there's two shots of uh, four four O's switching under the Court Street Bridge, uh, which, which, which are, are powered on the Ithaca train. There's a couple shots of the bridge. There's one shows a train running out uh, in back of the houses on William Street. Uh, there's a shot through the rear of a, a uh, car that was taken above George Street in Owego. And there's a shot of the right of way and of a, of a, of a locomotive underway. Uh, then there's a shot at the top of the hill looking out towards the valley. Then the rest of the photos are all in the Ithaca area, the area showing the engine terminals, uh, uh, some freight cars, uh, showing elements of the switchback, showing the Lehigh tracks paralleling the, uh, the, uh, the Lackawanna tracks, and then a couple of shots taken inside the caboose. Uh, most of the photos were taken by a fellow named, named Lou Bullock, who lives up near Whitney Point. And, and he got out a lot in the 30s and, and did a lot of local uh, rail photography. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, up at Auburn uh, had these particular negatives, so he let me borrow them and print them up. But uh, I've got about probably 850 Lackawanna photos, and the only thing I've got in the Ithaca branch personally is is the ones in a Wego. So I'm always looking for railroad negatives. Anybody has any? <laughs> so, yes. Uh, the line between here and Ithaca, did it have to go over any gorges on the way to Ithaca? Are there any remnants of that abutments left? I think there was anything significant. There was a fairly significant trestle in Brookendale. You're right, there was. You're right. Yeah. It was a wooden trestle. I don't think it was ever steel. Okay. Okay. Got a question? Got an answer? Thank you. The Lehigh went over a trestle, but the, the DL never did. They, they were down from the bottom. Okay, is this the Brookendale area? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Big okay. Uh, you mentioned Cornell student who was riding the train. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the high school kids that came to Candor uh, before they centralized okay. uh, had to come <coughs> on the train, say from Brookendale mm -hmm. or Catatonk or uh, other places, Wilsonville. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to Russ Manning who lived up on the hill there out of Wilsonville. And he walked all the way down to the station, which was about two miles from where he lived. And he said his uh, permit, or his uh, pass, mm -hmm. cost him a dollar, I think it was a dollar thirty-four or a dollar thirty-seven for a month. Really? To come to school. Mm -hmm. Even though he lived on a farm, he didn't like to get up mornings. <laughs> and he lived about two miles from, from, from Columbia Crossroads. And, maybe four miles from Troy, which is where I went to high school. 
And so he would have to get up in the morning and then walk to, to Columbia Crossroads to catch the train to take him to Troy. Brought him home the same way. Except he knew when he didn't get up in time. So when he didn't get up in time, he, he, he instead of trying to catch it at Columbia Crossroads, he would walk across the fields to the track, which was a, a much shorter distance. And they knew him well enough that they'd stop the train, pick him up, take him to school. <laughs> <laughs> We yes, had a yes. school teacher when I was growing up uh, who got her education by riding the, taking the Lehigh Valley up at her, near her home, up in what's called West Cander, taking the Lehigh Valley to Wilshireville, <coughs> trading their changing <coughs> trains, and coming down to Cander to our to Owego, to the normal school on the train to get her education. And Lucy Gooding, her name was, and she taught uh, eighth grade when Howard and I were in school, and she was one humdinger of a teacher out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we used to call her Miss Aspirin USA. Is there <laughs> and on the day, we could get her to take at least eight aspirin between nine o'clock and four. <laughs> <laughs> Good incentive, right? <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Tell us why it is. Yeah. Tell us why the standard gauge is four foot eight. Because it goes back to Roman times. If you ever uh, visited York, England, uh, there's a small <clears throat> archaic business section right in York. And uh, the, 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 the pavement there still is structured from when uh, that was under control of the Roman Empire. And I assume it's not the original stones, but uh, there is uh, basically groove wagon tracks uh, in front of these businesses, that and it's there's no automobile traffic in front of this the, 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 this this cluster of stores, but uh, that's that's gauged that four foot eight and a half. So I, I'm quite the width of the, the Roman chariot. chariot. Yeah, right. Which was the width of two battle horses. Was that what it was? Is that how it was the term? Of two battle horses. Interesting. I didn't know what was behind the number. I knew where the number what time was. Yes, Paul. Yeah, I ran across something a few years back. Uh, interesting. I gave a copy of it to the Cander Library. It was a bill of lading from the DLW for Buffalo Heights for about the 1890s. It went really? To, it went to Juan's uh, cannery Hides, for the shoe factory. And that was one of the things, of course, that came into Cander for our business there. Did they have a cannery in Cander in that time period? Did they? Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, Buffalo Heights, I would assume, at that point in time, number one, the buffalo herds were probably scaled down immensely. Well, what was there probably... I can't tell you the exact west. date, but it was in the 1800s. Really? Yeah. That was, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the library still has that, I imagine. I would hope so. That was a pretty big business, actually, because there was lots of hemlock uh, trees around here. And yeah. That used the bark in the mm -hmm. tanning process, so yeah. I've got some old... Uh, I've got I've got a book on the tanning industry in Pennsylvania and another one on the tanning industry in, in, in the Catskills and, and you know same thing there. You know. It was it was you know big business and uh, yes. Any famous politicians or personalities traveled through the Canada on the train? Not that I was able to determine. I'm sure there were some, but uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Did he? No. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I had quite an experience back when I was in high school with the railroad. Uh, the Benziles had uh, tours on the railroad that uh, picked up high schoolers from all, well, we had to go from North Valley to Ithaca. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many carloads of seniors there were on that train. And of course, we went back and forth before between the trains, and it was quite an experience for a country kid that never been on the fair field. <laughs> and another one, just after I graduated, I, my brother was working in uh, Schenectady, and I went up with him, stayed with my aunts for a few days, and I can remember the conductor as we were coming back to Binghamton. He called out before we got there. He called out every little bird that the train stopped. 
and the one I remember is skinny bus. <laughs> I can't remember any of the rest of them. I just love to hear him say that. Sounds like that was the DNA. But uh, we had a good time going to Washington. And some of the girls, they made dates between the boys on the other schools. We had a good time. Makes me think of a lady that lives in the community of Nichols, Wellsburg, checking in the livery stable in the morning. Uh, you know, either taking an Erie train from Wellsburg into Elmira, it's about five miles, or a streetcar, shopping for the day, coming back at the end of the day, going over and getting your horse and buggy at the livery stable, and taking it back to her home. I thought it was most interesting to have somebody still alive that that, can, that had experienced that sort of thing. And, uh, we may have to do that again for Gaskins. That's right. Good point. Good point. Yes. The uh, speaking of Cornell and students, uh, the Lackawanna ran uh, specials for several years after the regular passenger train closed down. You would hear um, in the middle of the night uh, the train go up through and uh, they were bringing kids from New York City back uh, really? from Christmas vacation oh, okay. uh, up through to Cornell. Uh, might be one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock, you'd hear them whistle down through the village. That's interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah, they had, uh, there would be uh, 12, 15 Pullmans. In fact, sometimes you would even run <coughs> two trains because mm. there was so many. And I assume that the, that the Lehigh had a light you know, situation too, so you know, they probably both tried to move kids like that. One other thing, I did a book on the Lehigh Valley in Sarah and Kwanda that came out in March of last year. And, and, and the research I did from that, one of the things I found most interesting was uh, that when they would have these special trains, they would basically stage the cars in Ithaca, okay? And, and this, this, this centered on Lehigh, but I guess, you know, common sense says it probably happened with, with the Lackawanna too. But, but the students would basically get on these cars and use them for, shall we say, rendezvous? <laughs> and uh, so they have to, they already had, 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 had quite a time when they were trying to get the, the cars uh, empty of people that aren't traveling on them so they could get, the, get the customers in and get, get all these kids out of the, the cars. So, so we get some interesting scenarios. My dad and grandfather were both Cornell students who know those trains. I guess I shouldn't have said what they said. <laughs> <laughs> they, they used to refer to them as the delay lever and wait. Yes. My, my grandfather, who grew up in Bath, uh, they call it the damn long and weary or the delayed and later and wait. The, the Canon and Grassburg was a chicken portion, and they, they had all sorts of names for these lines. So, uh, any other comments? The yes. old, uh, yeah, the, um, they used to have a train that went from, I can't remember exactly where they started, but they had uh, Morris Chain used to have a um, coal bin there. Mm -hmm. And they used to go over to Cornell, but they used to uh, go across uh, Roar Street, Street. Okay. and they used to uh, call that uh, Killer Hill, because whenever the truck tra uh, tra trailers went down, down Roar Street, they used to, uh, before they had the brake check up by um, St. Peter's, they used to lose their brakes right at that. That, right at that track. That's understandable. And then they took that, uh, took it out, and they still have the uh, train, but they still have, they go down through, down by uh, Buffalo Street in that area. Okay. Um, that, uh, now the right of way that's there by the Morris Chain plant is, is, is part of one of the switchbacks. Mm -hmm. In fact, my, my son walked out there here a couple of years ago. He was up there just, just scouting around, so he took a hike up there and you know, said there was still some spikes and ties laying up there and it was, it was very obvious where the switch was and, and where the track had run and so forth. So. I, got, I got an education on that railroad hump that he was talking about uh, when I for said nine months so uh, I went to the college and rode to school with a factory man and then got out of college about one o'clock, twelve o'clock rather than hang around till five I'd walk up to the railroad bump uh, my Morris chain stick my thumb out and hitchhike home. Oh, yeah? Got it down to a science, too. I couldn't <laughs> when and what vehicles I was being off, just coming go. home in. Mm -hmm. well, I was a uh, kid. 
seven, eight years old probably, I always look forward to going to, to uh, well, my dad's uncle had a cottage over on uh, Yucca Lake. So we'd go that way or, or even to Elmira if we went that way. But it was always a treat to see the, if you're lucky, to see the train going from Gwinnett and up to Park Station because mm -hmm. that was quite a grade. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. There'd be two steamers on the front and another one behind the pushing. Let's go back a few years. Quite, it? A, quite a thing uh, impressed me, oh, impressed yeah. me when I'm I was sure. a kid and I catch one of those trains. Mm -hmm. There's all the smoke and steam and bouncing. <laughs> Tough thing to see them work. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You've been a very, very, very enjoyable audience.